Hey FPC, Jamie Dickinson here. We are so glad you decided to join us. Uh, this month we have a ton of announcements, so look up here and pay attention. And finally, we will have an Uprush service on Friday, June the 30th. Hey FPC, we wanted to let you know that our youth camps are coming up this month. Junior camp will be June 5th through 9th. Crusaders camp will be June 12th through June the 16th. And senior camp will be June 26th through the 30th. Hyphen camp is going to be June 22nd through the 24th. They can register for camps by visiting flupci.com slash Florida District Children's Ministry. The church will provide transportation to and from the camp. Please feel free to visit our information desk for more information. As we begin our service, we thank you for choosing to worship with us.
Hallelujah. Why don't you give God praise for he is good. His mercy endureth forever. He's worthy of all praise. He's worthy of all worship. There is none like the Lord. There is none like Jesus. Truly goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Church, have you found him to be good? Have you found him to be faithful? Would you bless the Lord this morning and lift up his name? The Lord is good, worthy of all the praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Many times when you pass by construction sites, there are signs out front, and the signs usually tell you who the builder is. Not only the builder, but all the subcontractors and things. Normally you see all the signs. If they do work at your home, they'll place a sign out front if they're able to, and let you know who just did this work. They want you to know the good work. Who did that work? And you can find out by just looking at that sign. And this morning when I look in this congregation, I know who has done the work. When I look around this congregation, I see life after life after life, and I see... God's handiwork. His hands. His work. I see it. Your neighbor sees it. And the psalmist said it this way. He said, unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For thy name is near thy wondrous works declare his name is already near because he's been at work so today I want to encourage you and let you know his name is near everywhere you look you see Jesus everywhere you look in this congregation you see the work of Jesus you see how he has restored you see how Jesus has healed you see how Jesus has delivered you see how Jesus has transformed let me just declare that we give him thanks we're not giving thanks for the work we're giving thanks to the one who is worthy of all praise and all honor the psalmist said unto thee we give thanks and we give praise so if God God has done anything. How about you give the Lord praise this morning? His name is near. His marvelous works declare. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The good news is he's still at work. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. He is at work this morning. Why don't you greet a few people today and let them know that the Lord is near and he wants to work this morning in this place in your life. What a great God we serve. What a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. How great it is to be called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. To be able to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Ushers, if you would, go ahead and make your way on down at this time. We welcome all of our guests. If you're a guest with us this morning online or in person, we welcome you to First Pentecostal Church. Why don't we give all of our guests... A welcome right now. We bless you and thank you for being with us. We pray the Lord's blessings upon you today. If you are a first-time guest, you could stop by our information desk in the foyer before you leave this morning. We want to connect with you for just a moment. 
And uh, we do have a gift for you as well. So first time get, guest, there is a gift for you. Uh, but the greatest gift you can receive this morning is Jesus. And we invite you to find him today. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. There are many needs this morning. Jesus is able to minister to each and every one of these. So how about in faith, once again, we believe in in his word, knowing that there is nothing impossible for our God. Why don't we lift our hands to the Lord this morning and call upon his name one more time. We pray the Lord's blessings upon this offering, but there are many needs that are before you, many needs that you're aware of, that you have brought as well. Jesus We come unto you today believing that there's nobody that's outside of your sight, that there's nobody, Lord, that that you cannot see or hear today. You know exactly what we have need of in this place. Every one of these needs this morning, we bring them to your capable hands, and we pray, Lord, have your way. Lord, we cast all of our care upon you, Lord, because we know that you care for us, that you will sustain, that you will provide. We believe that you will send forth your word to heal. We believe that each person in this service this morning that needs a miracle, you're still a miracle worker. You're able to do a mighty work in this place today. Let it be done this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. We will not fail to give you all the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Now, church, why don't we rejoice again in the Lord? Again, I say rejoice.
privilege to be in his presence. I want you to clap your hands again one more time and lift your voice all over this house in one mind and one accord and give him praise in this place. With somebody give him praise, with somebody give him glory, with somebody give him what he is worthy of. Has he done a work in your life? Has he signed it and autographed it with his name? Taking ownership of what he's done in your heart. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for water baptism in Jesus' name. My sins are washed away. I have the power of creation living on the inside of me. Anything, anything is possible. Anything is possible. If you have your Bibles, turn your attention to Numbers chapter 7 and verse 1. And we'll begin there, reading the word of the Lord. It's great to see all of you here on this Sunday morning. We bless all of you in the wonderful name of Jesus. So thankful that you're in the house of the Lord today and trust and hope that you would receive something good from God and his word. Now notice First verse, Moses had fully set up the tabernacle. He had anointed it. He sanctified it. All the instruments, the altar, everything anointed, sanctified. It's set up. It's ready to go. It's ready for glory. And the glory filled the house. We understand that. Scripture teaches that. And it was just a magnificent time. And the princes knew that God had purposely constructed the tabernacle so that it could be transported from one place to another. And he knew that the sons of Aaron, the three sons, Merari, Gershon, Kohath, were going to have to be the ones to do that. And so they gave gifts to be able to make that a possibility. And they provided to Moses six covered wagons with 12 oxen. It's cool, isn't it? It sure did. Brought them all up in the house. And, and, and you can imagine that when they gave those gifts to Moses, they had anticipated that he would divide them evenly between the three sons. I mean, it just common sense would have taught you each one gets two. You know if you've got five kids and one gets one more than the other, you got a fight on your hands. So you plan it ahead of time. If you're going to give anybody anything, it better be one of each, two of each, or everybody better get the same. I don't care if you give a two-year-old a $100 bill and give one, another one five ones. They're going to want those five ones because they have no idea the value of what you just gave them. No idea of their value. You know that's what the princes were thinking. But Moses, under the direction of the Lord, had other plans. So to... Gershon, he gave two wagons. To Merari, he gave four wagons. Now notice this. And unto the sons of Kohath, he gave none. Absolutely none. Have you ever felt like God slighted you? I mean, just anybody in their common sense mind would have taken a slight at this. Everybody else gets four and somebody else gets two and I get none. Nothing. He got nothing. I mean, the Bible didn't even try to hide it. Oh, I got something better for you, Koath. He didn't even try to hide it. He said, you're going to carry your burden and you're going to bear it on your shoulders. Didn't even tell him the value of it. Didn't tell it at all. 
And there are people in this building right now that feel like you've been slighted, like you drew the, the short straw and that you got nothing. And I've just come to tell you, I'm gonna be honest with you, you got a raw deal. I don't know what the deal is, but you got a raw deal. Yes, you did. You've got pain. Well, it looks like everybody else gets wagons. You get none. But may I show you something in the scripture that you've not seen before? And I want to talk to you today about the song of the slighted. The song of the slighted. Shatabokoria. <laughs> When I tell you the genealogy and I show it all to you in just a moment, you're going to understand something about God. That when you got none, you may have gotten more than you realized when you got nothing. Because you're a Pentecostal preacher and you walk into a room of other preachers from other denominations, automatically there's a slight. Doesn't make any difference if you've got a doctorate degree from Harvard and one from MIT and another from Yale and your master's from Princeton. It makes no difference because you're Pentecostal, you're automatically slighted. But if they knew the treasure we carried, I said, if they knew the value of the hundred. You would understand the song. My text, the song of the slighted. God bless you. You may be seated. It does look like the sons of Koath had been slighted. And I may add that they had been deliberately slighted. Sometimes what God does not give us it just looks like a divine slight. All Moses had to do was divide the gifts evenly from the princes of Israel. Three times two equals what? All right, that's elementary. All he had to do was make it even. And nobody would have complained. Nobody would have questioned it. But there wouldn't have been a song come out of it either. And to the First son, he gave two. To the second son, he gave four wagons. And to Kohath, he gave none. Absolutely none. And it looks like they were left out on purpose. And they were. As a matter of fact, God said, I've got another purpose for them, and it's not wagons. And it was obvious that all of the materials, the boards and the sockets, silver and brass and everything, there's no way anybody could carry that by hand. You were going to have to carry that in wagons in order to get it from one point to another. That was the way it was built. But you know that curtains after curtains after curtains can get pretty heavy. And as big as those curtains were, you know you weren't going to be able to carry them by hand. So God made provision for them to be carried in the wilderness on wagons. And they saw it's not going to be any easy matter to move it from one place to another. And so that was the purpose of their gift, is to make that easier. Those six wagons and 12 oxen. And they gave none to the sons of Kohath. And to the carnal mind, you could easily say, who could blame Kohath for feeling like they were left out and feeling as if they had been slighted? Psalm 73 said, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, my foot well nigh slipped because I cleansed my heart in vain and I washed my hands in innocency and for all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. And he said, but if I talk like that to this next generation, I'm going to offend the next generation of children. But when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary and then understood I their end. There are many things in life that are not as they appear to be. They look one way, but they're really another. 
That's why all the road to heaven is paved in faith and trust. And church, we must trust him today. And we got to put our faith in Jesus Christ. We must remember that God always knows exactly what he's doing. And God knows the end from the beginning. And he sees it when you got the raw deal. And he sees it when you got the wrong end of that deal. He knows what it's like to be slighted. He understands it. But he knows the way that you take. He knows you by name. He knows your address. He knows when you were born and when you went to school. And he knows your down sittings and your uprising. And he knows everything there is to know about you. He knows where you are at all times. He knows your heart and he knows your mind. And nothing slips the eye of God. Not anything. The same one who knows Jesus Christ is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. And he knows that it looks like God may have slighted you and passed you by and left you out. But let it be known unto you this day, he has not done so. It is true that there are many dark threads that are woven into the fabric of life and that life is not all bright colors. It is also true that there are many loose ends and there are many things that have happened in all of our lives that have caused us to feel like we got a raw deal. And things that are happened to us that just don't make sense. Things that have happened to us on our pilgrimage that we have to fellowship the mystery. We just have to put our hand in the hand of the one who died for us and trust him. Because if you trust him, I've come to tell somebody everything's going to be all right when you put it in God's hands. And if you think you've been slighted by the Lord in any way, in any way whatsoever, the truth is you have not been. It's a faithful saying, church, and I think that everybody here ought to accept it. Jesus Christ has never slighted you. I don't care what the circumstance looks like. I don't care what the situation is. I don't care what somebody said or what they're saying about you now. I don't care if it's a preacher. I don't care if it's a parent. I don't care if it's an authority figure or somebody that you care about. It makes no difference. The Lord has never slighted you. It's just a perceived slight. But they got four wagons, and then they got two wagons, and I got none. But the one who was most burdened, who had to carry in the heat of the wilderness on their shoulders, they had something that was beyond measure, and it was beyond price. Uh, They carried it on their shoulders. Now, I'm sure Marari and Gershon, they were very happy to have their six covered wagons because they were dancing and playing with their kids along the way while they were walking in the wilderness, having a big time. But it was Koath who was had the burden on their shoulders but you remember Gershon and Merari were behind them and Koath was out front leading the way when you bear the burden you have to go out and chase off the predators and step on the scorpions and chase off the snakes you got to find a resting place for that tabernacle and for the children of Israel. You're the one that is tasked with that responsibility to go out and find that place. And you go out to do just exactly that. And everybody else behind, why haven't you found that resting place? Why aren't you excited? Why don't you have a smile on your face? Why aren't you jumping up and down? I want to know why you're cracking the whip and wondering why they're bearing the burden and, and you're back here having a good time and yet you want them to do their job so you can have it a, a little easier. Mm. How many of you ever experienced that? But Marari... Gershon, they didn't have a song. It was Koath who possessed the song. Moses penned the words. Because when they got out front, they sang it. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. They lifted their load to their shoulders and they sang the song that Moses wrote. 
Now, David put music to it in the book of Psalms, but it was Moses who wrote that song and wrote those words, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. They sang their song, and that song, even in the heat of the day, when they walked through the wilderness, is what not only kept them, but it produced a generational song that would live beyond them, that would continue to flow from one generation to the next. I don't worship just for me. I worship for this next generation. I'm not just interested in coming to church and getting blessed myself, and maybe that's all where you're at right now, and that's fine. I'm going to do my job, and I'm going to carry my ark, and I'm going to sing my song so you can get your little sweetheart blessed. But I'm not singing for myself, and I'm not praising God to get something out of the service. I'm praising God so that these kids will know that there is a God in Israel. There is a king in Israel. There is a God who still loves us. Somebody had to carry that ark. Somebody had to carry the candlestick. Somebody had to carry the altar of incense on their shoulders and they picked it up and they put it on their shoulders and they went out into the heat of the wilderness with the sun bearing down upon them. I know they had the pillar of cloud by day, but it was little shade for having to carry the weight and the heaviness of those articles of instruments of worship from the tabernacle. They never saw the vessels they carried. They were, they were covered with all kinds of coverings, and that was all done before they ever put them on their shoulders. They never saw the beauty of those instruments. Not one time did they ever see it. They picked them up and put it on their shoulders without ever seeing it, and still they sang their song. Because I may not see the value of what every service does in, in the lives of people, but I'm not going to quit just because I don't see the result with my own eye. And you got five people that will come up after every service and tell you, I didn't see it, and I didn't see that, and I don't see it here, and I don't see it there because they're blind, and they've got wagons. But I might be able to carry that ark on my shoulders and not see its impact on everybody around me. But I don't have to see it to know its value. And I don't have to see it to know how priceless it is. If God touches one soul in this house, it is greater. Pentecost, we may feel slighted by the world who does not love us, but I've come into the house to bless the Lord. I don't care if they value it or not. I know what I've got. I know in whom I have believed. I know the value of what I have. You missed it in the text. You missed it altogether because if you go back to the text that I read to you and that was up on the screen and you had it on the cheat screen and you still missed it, bless your heart. If you'll notice, Merari and Gershon, when they got their wagons, it was for the work of their service. But when he said, Kohath got none, he said, because I want them to bear it on their shoulders, that which belongeth to them. Woo, hallelujah. Some of you are here just to do a job, but I'm here for an inheritance. My, 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 you thought it was just your duty to come to church, but to me, there's greater value than my duty. It's a treasure that belongs to me. 
Listen, clapping my hands and praising the Lord is not my duty. It belongs unto the people of God. The Bible says praise belongeth unto Judah. It is Judah's responsibility. It is something that belongs to them. It is their possession. It was their possession to be able to pick up an unseen ark and carry it on their shoulders. I'm sorry, even though I can't see it, there's still glory that trickles down. I only have a measure of what Jesus had. He had the Holy Ghost beyond measure. I've only got a touch of it. I've only got a measure of it, but I'm still gonna carry it anyhow because somehow, I said somehow, it's gonna be worth it all. I've come to tell you it's gonna be worth it all. Some of you that have not borne the heat of the day, you worship because of wells that have been dug for you. You feel something not because of your own dedication, but because of the dedication of other people. You sense the presence of the Lord in this place because somebody got up early. Somebody was praying in the morning. Somebody was seeking after God. Somebody fasted and prayed to bring you the glory in this house. You may not understand or value it at this particular moment, but I invite you to come and experience what God is wanting to do in this place because everybody in this church is important. I said everybody in this church is important. Everybody here is valuable. The church has got people that are just pillars. They're just here. They don't really make a big scene, but they're here. They love God with all of their heart, and they live a Christian life. When the songs are sung, they sing. When people are worshiping, they worship. When the offering is passed, they put their tithes in their offerings. They will never teach a Sunday school class. You'll never see their name on the board unless they're sick. You'll never know them or know their name. They'll never sing a special, but they're filling a place that God gave them to fill. God doesn't always explain himself, but we don't see the whole picture, church. All we see is just a little bit of a snapshot of what eternity's gonna be, but I'm gonna be faithful to what God gave me to carry. I'm gonna be faithful in the heat of the day when nobody appreciates it, when nobody values it, when everybody slights you uh, because it wasn't their camp meeting sermon and you're not their favorite preacher. I'm still gonna preach it uh, and I'm still gonna be faithful. I don't care how they might slight me. I'm gonna bless the Lord, oh my soul, because I've got a song. They didn't give it to me and they can't take it away. You just can't beat a person that's in the house of God every time the doors are open. You just can't beat somebody that's going to worship every time the worship starts. You just can't beat somebody that's going to be faithful no matter if they're up, no matter whether they see the results or not. I'm carrying glory on my shoulder. I'm carrying power on my shoulder. I'm carrying a treasure that cannot be measured by gold. It cannot be measured by money. It's greater than anything this world has ever seen. A soldier on the front lines doesn't see the whole picture. He's not the general that sees the whole battle plan. He gets his orders, cross that creek, take that hill. That's what he gets from the general. Passed down to the chain of command to where, whether it's a lieutenant or a sergeant in the, in the trench, get out of your trench cross that creek and take that hill. And he doesn't see the battle plan, he doesn't see the air cover, he doesn't see all of the naval ships where they're at. All he sees is that he's gotta get up and there's five machine guns on that hill pointed at his head, shooting with everything they've got to take him down. So he goes from one tree to the next tree focused on one thing, I'm gonna take them brothers out because I'm taking this hill. I've got my orders. 
And church, we've got our orders. We don't see the whole battle plan. But we're here on a Sunday morning. And the orders say, take that hill. Get up out of your trench. I know you're depressed. I know you feel like you got a raw deal. I know you feel like everybody got wagons and you got nothing. But get up out of your depression and say, I'm going to take that hill. I've been shot at for the last time, devil. You've taken and hurt my family for the last time. Now, we don't even know why God told them to carry those pieces of furniture on their shoulder until David shows up on the scene. We have no clue. It's just a mystery. There's really no logic behind it. He just didn't trust these treasures to oxen who could not perceive the value no matter what you taught them. You could send those brothers to Sunday school. You could send them to Eagle School, and they're still going to low right out of their place. That you can't teach an ox to be an eagle. I might also say you can't teach turkeys to be eagles. You can't send a duck to eagle school. They're just going to waddle to get their diploma and crack their way out. <laughs> I'm sorry, it don't work. He wanted somebody to carry it that would value it. Would value what they're doing. Would value their place in the kingdom. Not until David shows up do we even know why. And you remember David's trying to bring the ark back home from him because it had been 40 years missing because Eli and all of that bunch lost it in a battle somewhere. And uh, you know how the story goes. And some of you that went to Sunday school, if you didn't go to Sunday school, I don't have time this morning to give you a Sunday school lesson, okay? But the ark's coming back and they get to a threshing floor and Uzzah sees the oxen. They were carrying it on a, on a wagon with oxen. The oxen stumbled and it looked like the ark was going to fall and be broken and Uzzah reached out and stabilized and God killed him dead as a hammer because it displeased the Lord. David was afraid and said, how can the ark of God come home to me? Put it in Obadiah's house for three months before he figured out what in the world went wrong. When he went back to the book, he said, it's got to be carried on the shoulders of the priest because oxen will never value what it carries but a soul that's been redeemed from sin, a heart that's been shown mercy in the midst of trial, one who's been beaten down and beat up and beat up so much they don't even know who they are, addicted to this and addicted to that, but God found you and by grace he redeemed you and you pick an unseen treasure up and you're carrying it on your shoulder. Now you know, now you know why it's so important that you need to carry it. You can't just let music be your worship. And I'm going to do worship. I'm going to do worship. I'm going to do my praying. I'm going to do all of my stuff. I'm going to do my stuff because I can't count on yours. And we got too many people counting on the preacher to do it. And we don't have enough people doing it because they need to do it. But you don't know how I've been slighted in life. I've gotten a raw deal. Maybe you have, but pick that thing up. Take up your cross and follow him. And understand the value. I know there's people in here that are wearing sackcloth underneath your beautiful garments. I know your secret burden and your secret heartache is something that only you can really gauge how painful it is. And it appears that you've been slighted because when the gifts were given, you got none and everybody else got much. It's so important that you and I be faithful in this place and in the heat of the day and not grumble and complain and gripe because we got a raw deal. So 
Some of you have been sick, you don't know why. Some of you have been hurt and you don't know why. There are people that don't like you and you don't know why. You've tried to figure it out, they just don't like the way you look. You just look funny. But I tell you what, I'm just going to carry what God has given me to carry because it belongs to me. Instead of fighting my raw deal, I'm going to own it. And say, all right, I got a raw deal, but I'm going to praise the Lord anyhow. And that song. Now, you don't know the genealogy, but let's go back to the book of Psalms because we don't even know why Koath was singing, why Moses gave them the song and not Merari or or Gershon. He gave it to Koath because they're leading out front. And if anybody's going to lead, they're going to sing. I don't care how heavy they're carrying. I don't care what the load is. I don't care how hot it is. You're going to sing. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. (laughs) I don't know if that was the music that they had to it. But you know, Asaph was the most prolific psalmist other than David. He wrote more songs than anybody else in Psalms except for David. Asaph was the one who wrote the songs to the sons of Korah. Why? Because notice the genealogy. Asaph was the head choir master. And he was the head choir master under David's tabernacle of David. And he was the son of Korah, the son of Kohath. Jeduthun and Heman were also choir directors. They were the sons of Merari and the sons of Gershon. But it was, if you remember in the titles of the Psalms, it was Asaph who wrote the song and then sent it to Jeduthun and, tell, and told him, I want you to sing this to the tune of Shoshana Meduthun, whatever that is. Sing it to the tune of Mitchum, and you sing it with this song and this music because he was the choir master. Woo, hallelujah. Not only did he write the song, but he directed the song. My, 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 my. I tell you right now, if you get a hold of what I'm preaching, you won't sit back and moan and groan about your circumstance. When God found some of you, you were worthless and penniless. But God has brought you up. He has brought you out. It's not been easy. But God has raised you up and he has blessed you so you can bless the kingdom. I want to be faithful. I want to carry my burden anyhow. I want to do it because God gave it to me. It belongs to me. Now, can you imagine Simon and Cyrene, the black man that was chosen by the Roman soldiers to carry the cross of Jesus? Can't you imagine Simon was a little bit slighted by the interruption to his schedule? To be given the responsibility by these Roman soldiers to carry the cross. Can you imagine how badly he felt about that? I mean, I know Jesus was struggling to carry his cross, but it was given to Simon by the Roman soldiers and he was forced to it. He didn't say, oh, oh, let me carry that cross. I see that he's struggling. I want to help him get to the cross. I want to help him get crucified here. The Roman soldiers picked him out and forced him to carry that cross. And how many of you feel like you've been under the burden of a forced cross and you didn't want, but yet it's there. He picked it up, but you remember the first man to touch the blood was Simon Cyrene. He was the first man to touch the blood of Jesus. Because when he carried the cross, he was The blood was trickling down. And you got to go to the book of Romans to find out that his two sons were partners with Paul in the gospel. And they were sons of Simon the Cyrene. I just, oh my, 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 my. Church, I'm not just fighting for you. And I'm not just fighting for me. But I'm fighting for this younger generation. And if you don't think it's a battle, 
with the transgender, with the mutilation of kids that's going on today, approved by medical science. You hear me, there are privileges. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. He will minister to you. He will show you grace. He will bless you. I say, Abraham, you might have been left with just the rough mountains of Judea while Lot gets the well-watered plains of Sodom. And I've come to tell you that Sodom is not our home. Can you count the stars and the sands? That's how much your seed's gonna be. Church, the church is gonna live on. So pick up your cross and follow him and sing your song and love your Jesus. And say, I've been slighted. I'm not even questioning that. When somebody gets four wagons and another gets two and you get none, I don't know that you could feel any other way. I'm sorry. That's just the facts of life. And I doubt if Koaf felt they were special till they picked up that ark. So pick your ark up. You say, but I can't see the value of what I'm carrying. I promise you, the glory is in your burden. <laughs> the glory. Well, Brother Kinsey, I wished I was raised in Pentecost. Well, I was raised in Pentecost, and it's no cup of tea. Yes, it's better to be raised in church, but that's no guarantee. That's no guarantee you'll do anything. I wish I was raised in a preacher's home. No, you don't. There are burdens there that you don't want to carry. God didn't give that to you. But my mama was this, my daddy was this. You might all be right about that, but pick that burden up. Whether you were or whether you weren't, whether you were offended in church or offended in the world, don't worry about it. Pick it up. Own it. It may have all happened, but it's not going to stop us. And it's not going to stop you from being who God wants you to be. Shut up, You've remained in your hurt too long to where you have not seen the value and the pricelessness of the treasures that I have given you. But I say now, rise up, take your burden, carry it, and I will deliver you from your wounds. There will be no difference. You, it will be as if you have never been wounded. You will be stronger. You will be greater. You will be better than you have ever been before. Rise up and worship me. If you feel nothing, rise up and worship me. If you see nothing, rise up and sing your song. And I will be with you. And I will bring you out.
Come on, Asaph. Write your song. Step out from where you're standing and walk up here. Walk up here right now. Come on, walk up here right now. Come on, walk up here right now and begin to worship. God said he would heal you. God would said, I'll bring you out. Hallelujah. I just want you to lift your hands however much you are able to. And I want you to together with one mind and one accord, I want you to repent and say, now God, I've, I've stayed back and I felt slighted for whatever reason, whatever things of your past, then all of us have got a different story and I understand all of that. But you're making up in your mind right now, the past is not holding me back any longer. I'm laying it at the cross. I'm putting it at Calvary and I'm gonna worship my Jesus and I'm gonna take up my cross and I'm gonna bring it to the Lord, and I'm gonna sing my song. Now you lift your voice and start praising him right now. And let the, oh yeah, yeah, send up, oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Now you let the Holy Ghost flow through you. Hallelujah. 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 Shatabo Yarriya Nama. Kaya Raboya Shataya. Koya Rabo. Kaya rabo ya shatabaya. Kaya leli ya rabo ya shatama. Kaya rabo shatabale ya nama. Halalalalalia. Put your hand on somebody around you and begin to pray with them right now and begin to seek the Lord with them. the good 